The other thing that we're watching here is Fed Chair Jay Powell saying the labor market actually looking peachy. So he says in his speech yesterday, our economy is currently performing very well overall with strong job creation and gradually rising wages. In fact, by many national level measures, our labor market is very strong. Then look at what Fed hike expectations are. We now are looking at a cut for 2020, and we're now looking at barely, barely any move uh, in 2019. In fact, the journal had an article today that we'll see a pause after December. David, what do you think? I don't think equity markets are looking at what the Fed futures are saying six quarters out right now. I, I think it's been about. So you don't think it's, it's about the yield curve in the Fed? No, I think it is in the short term, not not into 2020. I okay. don't think that the market takes seriously what the Fed funds futures say six quarters out. We, it hasn't been a predictive measurement for over 10 years. Years. Mm-hmm. So, Constance, is the flattening in the yield curve on the, on the short side of the curve justified? Mm-hmm. Well, look, flattening, if, let's say inversion, actually, yeah. So, it would be justified based on global conditions, right? And I think this this pullback in ten year yields is all about global conditions. We started this year with tailwinds to growth globally. Now we have headwinds to growth globally, and so is it justified yet? Yeah, the global markets are concerned. Um, the question is, how much of inversion do we need to see that transfer into the money multiplier in the U.S.? So, in the October uh, survey, uh, the consumer the, the lender survey, what the Fed found was that in commercial real estate, 42% of lenders said they would tighten lending standards if the yield curve slightly inverted. Mm. For C&I loans, so commercial and industrial loans, 19% said they would tighten lending standards if the yield curve slightly inverted. Watching the results of that survey, seeing if those numbers tick up is important. And let's all remember, economics happens at the margin. So even that slight shift mm. is enough to impact just liquidity conditions throughout the economy. You're and not- that all important investment component. Yeah. You're nodding, David? Completely agree. That dollar liquidity is very much impacted by exactly what she's talking about. And I think that dynamic is the way it's going to play out. So your question of isn't it justified, the, what the yield curve does is always justified. It's it's telling you what is in fact happening. But indeed, I still don't believe the 210 is going to invert. I think that the 210 only inverts if they actually make a policy mistake. And, and uh, maybe this is hope instead of just real uh, prediction. But I believe that the Fed is seeing that they have to kind of backtrack a bit. They hike in December, guide differently into 2019. Mm-hmm. But there was a conversation I had yesterday on set that basically that, because uh, the data here, is, some of it's still crushing it. I mean, the non-manufacturing ISM was awesome sure. yesterday. Yeah. I mean, new orders, really good. So is there a um, conversation to be had that what the market's telling the Fed is that their monetary policy is too tight for the rest of the world instead of maybe the U.S.? Like, can you make that kind of distinction? It seems plausible. I do think, look, a cut in 2020, we'd need a real turnaround in the global and, I mean, a real, really more significant headwinds to have mm-hmm. a cut in 2020. But I agree with David, a pause in 2019 is certainly possible. And let's remember, the Fed has never been able to engineer a soft landing when the unemployment rate falls below the natural rate. Now, this isn't to say that they're not always learning and course correcting and improving and tweaking their, their methodology, but it's very, very, very difficult. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not so sure that the uh, it makes sense that they would be cutting in 2020 based on what the futures are telling you about 2019. What is the efficacy of a cut before they've even gotten to the natural rate, to the neutral rate in the in the short term? I, I just think that ultimately they have to get that rate to where they believe it is neutral in the economy yeah. for a cut to have any efficacy anyways. And so ultimately that's been the policy objective is to get that rate there. Problem is they weren't quite able to get there by the time the economy started going through other uh, uh, twists and turns. The, the trade war is a big issue. And, and obviously, Chairman Powell can't talk about it. This is It's not his job to kind of comment on sort of political policy ramification. The fact of the matter is that you could, if you see CapEx surge, mm-hmm. GDP surge, the other impacts that would have throughout the rest of the economy, it would be, go back to this fear of overheating mode. David wants clarity. Come on. Clarity? Yeah. Come on. What are you thinking? All right, yeah. Constant Hunter, KPMG, and David Bonson of Bonson Group. All right, slicing the apple, Morgan Stanley cutting its price target for Apple, slashing estimates for 2019 iPhone sales on weakening replacement uh, phone demand uh, in China. Yet what's interesting about this is that tech was the uh, index that actually wound up leading the charge yesterday from peak to trough. That 3% move was pretty staggering. Uh, and now you have uh, just tech overall down about 1% over the next three, last three days. Still with me, Constant Hunter of KPMG and David Bronson of Bronson Group. David, do you like tech? 
Uh, well, we kind of have a delineation we make between old tech and new tech. We like companies that actually make money and pay it to us. Okay, so I do believe Cisco, Intel, Apple are uh, even we even put IBM in that list are tech companies, but we just obviously they're older tech than the more attractive Fang names. Um, we do not like Fang. We haven't liked it all year, and then finally we got eight weeks where we looked good by not liking yeah. it. But the fact of the matter is that because we're free cash flow oriented investors. We like the dividend yields. We like the balance sheet strength, mm -hmm. more defensive characteristic. You just have a really attractive multiples with Cisco's and IBM's, and we would never touch is, the Netflix. Is that a late cycle call for you, too, or no? It's not. Uh, we're kind of permanently attracted to more defensive and less cyclical characteristics. Uh, so, Constant, talking about the, the, the late cycle, there's also a conversation in the market that we're seeing maybe a global leadership rotation, that less about the rotation in the, in the U.S. market, but globally. Is there a global market that is stronger than the rest that is unidentified right now? Mm. Ooh. Well, probably. It was supposed to be Europe 12 months ago. Yes, it's definitely not happening in Europe. Um, it's possible Japan is, is, you know, it took a little dip. It's starting to turn around. Um, I'm hearing some interesting things from investors looking at Japan and, and finding equities to invest in. Mm -hmm. So uh, while the number of listed companies in the U.S. is shrinking, the number of listed companies in Japan is actually growing. And I think for some uh, investors that are they're, they're finding interesting opportunities there. Um, with that said, look, the Bank of Japan has said there are kind of limits to this monetary policy we're pursuing. If we continue to pursue it aggressively, it could have negative uh, impact down the road as it as it uh, causes too much leverage to be taken. So Japan kind of has to run with, we have to see if it can run without training wheels, but if it can, that's that's a potential market. One caveat, of course, is how tight it is to China. So I think hmm. the really big issue, the, there's two things for 2019. One is sort of recession watch, like 2019 will be all about recession watch. And then it will also be all about what are the global risks? What are the global risks from trade? What's going on? In China's economy, how is that impacting the region? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so Japan is certainly very tied to that. Right. And and that would be my big caveat there. Well, let me add to the Japan comment. We uh, I went about 20 years as a global asset allocator out of Japan, and and oh. pretty much was right for about 20 years. And then in August of 17, we took a position there, and I was early, I believe. However, not only do I agree with you, I I think it's even more interesting in the corporate sector. It's not as much a top-down call, but just company-wide. Yeah. They have a 28 percent dividend payout ratio. Europe is about double. The United States is well into the mm -hmm. 40s. They desperately need cash. They have 5 trillion yen on corporate balance sheets. They don't need to pay. They don't need to borrow money for CapEx for years. So, so their leverage is, is not... So, so they have an incredible sector. ability for the corporate sector to increase profitability and increase payouts. And I just think Japan bottom up has a real attractive element. So we talk about equity rotation here in the U.S. It's okay. If tech's not going to lead, what is it? Financials, energy, etc. Is that the same, would you have that conversation about Japan equities, like what sector leads? Um, well, not as much what sector leads, but what in individual companies are the most, you know, viable because we are bottom-up buyers. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's very likely that in the U.S. the sectors are going to surprise people. Um, I, I don't know if in Japan it, it's going to be sectors that it has traditionally been there. Mm -hmm. But I do think that in the U.S. the Fang leadership is done. That's so, not so going to lead. Place? Well, um, I, it really depends a lot on this trade war related issue. I think that the industrials um, have gotten hit in, mm -hmm. as a result of a lot of the, the activity in the last seven weeks, but they should be doing better than they are. Consumer discretionary yeah. is not going to lead. Fang's not going to lead. I mean, energy is deeply undervalued, no question, but it's well, 6% of the S&P, so how much can it really lead the whole and index? And we will get to that. So Constant Hunter of KPMG, David Bonson of Bonson Group will be sticking with me and talking about the global growth and demand. So with us, Constant Hunter of KPMG, G, David Bonson of Bonson Group. So answer the question, global demand growth, key for oil. What do you see? Well, certainly you sort of pivoting back to one of the conversations we had in an earlier segment, this low oil price is very good for consumers. And I think you could see a stronger than expected holiday season as a result. Um, and it really gets to this dichotomy of what is driving growth. Mm -hmm. Throughout the recovery, the consumer has driven growth. We've had 97 consecutive months of jobs growth, probably 98 today. And 
investment has lagged. Some of the investment that we saw in the beginning of this year in the U.S. was in fact oil related in that investment in structures. So if we see lower oil prices, we're less likely to see an investment pickup because there's going to be less oil investment. We're more likely to see consumer continuing to carry the torch. And that's good for the short term, but for the long term, we need more investment mm -hmm. and more productivity to drive our economy. Which clearly goes into your thesis, David, too. But talking about free cash flow, Two months ago, you're probably loving energy, right? The big oil companies throwing off key, key, uh, free cash flow like crazy, dividends coming in, buybacks coming in. What about now at $56 still, oil? Still love it. And, and again, the natural gas story has to be talked about along with this mm -hmm. story. Let me first say that I can't even say how much I've enjoyed reading Mr. Jurgen over the years, and it was a pleasure to follow the entire interview. But I, I do believe that when we talk about the global growth story, which is where this the oil conversation comes in, the demand story has to be understood in terms of global growth. Um, to me, the trade war has to be settled before we're going to know if we're talking about 2020, 2022 metrics. Mm -hmm. But the, to her point on the either business investment or consumer leading whatever is going to be driving economic growth, I think that you could very well get Chinese consumption of LNG buying from the U.S. to become a major U.S. infrastructure story that would drive business investment and not force us to be continually reliant on the U.S. consumer. So do you like uh, oil stocks? We, we or like more, or energy more infrastructure gas, stocks. Energy infrastructure. So we try to be commodity agnostic. But to me, uh, when you look okay. at Chevron and Exxon dropping 4% when oil drops 30%, I don't see that as a very high correlation. And I don't get why it, ha it doesn't work both ways. Oil goes 50 to 70. The stocks don't move. It goes 70 to 50. People worried about the stocks. They're they're Completely operating right. in a different buzz. Yep. Completely right with that. All right, Constant Hunter, KPMG, and David Bonson of Bonson Group. Such a pleasure to have you both. Thank you very much.